you do know, whatever you do what, whatever it takes. I mean, apart from borrowing of the money, um, I committed a couple of card frauds. Um, I sold obviously possessions. We we have like you do in America, pawnbrokers. So I take whatever I've got to the fucking pawnbrokers and sell whatever I've got. You know, you you do whatever you it takes to have that bet. And like I don't know what it's like to be an alcoholic or drug addict, but I'm presuming, like you say, the addictions are similar. You 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 can't whatever it takes, you will do. Hence why we have a lot of crime with with uh, with drug addiction in, in the UK. Where you are now may not be where you came from. The choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction. Discover a riveting, true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. Visit kddmediacompany.com. Welcome to Knocking Doors Down, author of Red Card, Tony Kelly. How are you, good sir? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Thank you for the invite. Thank yeah. you to both of you. No, it's, it's good to make your acquaintance, of course, through our mutual friend, uh, Catherine, a former guest, and uh, helping continue to shed the light on gambling addiction, which, you know, needs a lot more awareness. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Catherine, I, I contacted, we made contact 2015-16, um, when my first book, Red Card, came out, and uh, she's been brilliant in terms of support, uh, in terms, of, as you know, with, with her story. So it resonated, it matched, and I think we're just both on this crusade of, uh, of raising awareness and education. So, uh, yeah, she's been a great support for me. So, yeah, and, but in terms of you know, education, awareness, and, and problem gambling in the UK, not, you know, I don't know how, I know it's big in the US, but yeah. uh, it's just grown over the last probably, probably over the last, 10 years, 15 years in the UK, it's just been bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can talk about in a bit. Yeah, you know, I have my speculation here, but I haven't done any work other than obviously talking with yourself and Catherine as far as gambling addiction. Yeah. You know, really the only two people I've spoken to that have come outward about gambling addiction and raising awareness. Uh, what really prompted the, the writing of the book? Yeah. Did you just feel after everything that you went through and seeing it um, not only the wreckage that it caused for yourself on a personal level, your family and loved ones, yeah. but also seeing it within the game of football too? Yeah, there's a few reasons, really. I mean, uh, 2012, um, my sister's a head teacher. Um, there was there was snippets coming out in the English press about ex-footballers gambling, getting into gambling. And uh, it was her that sort of put it to me that maybe I should try and put something to print. Now, you know, let's be honest about it. I didn't know where to start when it comes to writing a book. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but for some somehow I, I wrote a couple of chapters, sent it to her. She said, "Yeah, you, yeah, this is great. You can do this. Start from you know nine years old and go through the professional football career, go through the addiction, go through racism in in, in Coventry, which is a city in, in the UK, um, and make it a biography in that." So the strange thing is that once I put pen to paper, I couldn't stop writing. I just literally could not stop writing. Uh, Eighteen months took me. Uh, no computer, no ghostwriter, no laptops, none of that. Just A4 paper and my trusted biro, my trusted biro and A4, A4 paper. <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah, and it's crazy. And I just write and I had this manuscript up there uh, 18 months later. And I thought, wow, I've finished. And I told my sister, she said, right, just go to um, go online and send it to some publishers. Had some good feedback. And then, yeah, we got it published in 2014. So that was the start of the recovery. Um, and, and obviously two main reasons why I wanted to get the, the book out is one is to raise awareness and two is to um, because I've got a big family, you know, lots of you know five brothers, lots of cousins, and nephews, et cetera. And I wanted to get. Yeah. And, and the majority of my family and friends didn't have a clue to the depths of what I've been through. Um, so I wanted to get that out there for them as well. So they were aware of, you know, they, they can say, oh, right. So that's that's actually what happened, because we, we used to go to, I don't know functions or whatever and um you know if cousins are there and they'll say oh you know how can you not Tony not driving a bloody you know 30 grand BMW or whatever because obviously all my money had gone you know but they, they think oh because I was a footballer for nine years I should have it blah 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 but I didn't I didn't really want to go into detail about my addiction so yeah the book was a way of telling people what I've been through mm. yeah and not to mention I'm sure it's therapeutic talking about it or writing about it right yeah very cathartic very therapeutic definitely without without a shadow of a doubt and I think you know 
from the publication of the book. I've done a lot of media stuff. Um, so we have a, we have a show um, on, in the UK, which is the biggest morning breakfast show, which is called BBC Breakfast. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, I went on that. And uh, I think the feedback from that um, and then other radio stations have done, I think that made me realise, right, there's a lot more that needs to be done here. And people, it's, it's resonated with a lot of people. And I think, I thought, right, okay, what, what can I do next? And that's when I had the idea of, of setting up the organisation. Yeah, well, you, you uh, mentioned a couple of things I want to loop back to, just throwing it out yeah. there. Talking about, uh, you know, racism, uh, where you grew up, you mentioned nine years old. Yeah. Assuming that's about when soccer really became a love. Yeah. But, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, Red Card Gambling Support Project and let's dive back into kind of childhood growing up because it sounds like sounds like you're one of several siblings and, you know, so it's yeah. always interesting. Yeah, I mean... The, 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 if we start with the, the football, um, nine years old, I always wanted to be a footballer. My, my sort of introduction to football was, was Brazil 74, Jarzino, Revelino, that era, that team. That was my, that's when I fell in love with football. Um, and so, and that yellow kit and all the rest of it, yeah, that, that's when I really fell in love with football and, and I wanted to be a footballer. Um, now, it's, it's not an easy route. Um, obviously, you play the local football, play for your school team play for your county and then it's basically you, you hope you get spotted by a scout uh, or you go into an academy so i don't know if you're aware of academies we have in england in the professional football game mm, yeah yeah, so, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm completely un- uneducated in that aspect. right yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think i correct me if i'm wrong i don't remember if you knew what it was or didn't know when i said well you know out on the pitch Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, so about. which is yeah, the, fo- yeah. the, the football field in right. well, yeah. soccer, as we call it, is pitch. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, edu- let's educate Mike. Let's educate Mike. <laughs> educate me, guys. What, yeah. what am I missing here? Educate me. Yeah. So the, just the general route. So I was nine years old, playing for a school team, etc. cetera. And then you hope you get sc- scouted. If you do get scouted at 12 or 13, you go into an academy. So Tottenham Arsenal, whatever it is, or even the lower divisions, whatever team it is. You go into academy, you'll still go to school, but you'll train twice a week during the week. You still go to school and you finish at 16, leaves in UK, we leave school at 16. Mm -hmm. And when you get to 16, if you're still with that club, then they give you the option of either releasing you or they give you the option of offering you a two year scholarship. Oh, okay. Yeah, the two year scholarship is 16 to 18. And at 18, again, you either get released or you get offered a professional contract. So that's the sort of route how it works. So with me, I went. I, I did the tra- traditional route, and at 16, I got offered a contract at Bristol City, um, two-year scholarship. But the, <laughs> this is a crazy bit. So at 16, I became the youngest player ever to play for Bristol City's first team, which was 16, 244 days. That record stood for 20 years. Now, everybody in, in the football world and, and family and friends back home in my hometown of Coventry Everyone thought that, you know, I'm going to go on to stardom with Bristol City. They were quite, quite a biggish club in the UK football. Then, you know, they're in the second tier of football. I've been in the championship now. Um, and, but the strange thing is, when I, when I made that achievement, I, I, you know, when I look back now, my, my attitude was, was an absolute nightmare. I was going out with the senior pros, clubbing it at 16, 17, coming in at three in the morning. Uh, thinking I've made it. Remember, I'm still a scholar. I'm not a pro. I'm still a scholar. Um, and so I had the talent, but I didn't have the attitude. So the, I stayed in what they call digs. So the digs is a family, which um, the, the, the young person, the young player, me, stay with, uh, you know, a couple. They look after you, but they're connected to the football club. So they will give reports back to the manager to see how Tony's is behaving in the house, etc. Is he going out? Like all those things. So my report obviously was a nightmare. Sneaking girls back in at three in the morning. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, but, but that was that was but that was just my that was just my character. It was just the way I was. I was a little bit wild. Um and then obviously in training, not really putting it in, thinking I'm Jack the lad. So come 17, I, I did you know, I didn't even get to 18, never mind that. I got to 17. Uh, so after a year, I was called into the office and uh, Terry Cooper, who used to play for England and Leeds. Uh, he um, just called me in and said, you know, Tony, your, your attitude stinks. You will. You know, I remember his words. He said, you you probably will become a professional footballer, but not now. He said, we're going to have to release you. And, no, and that, that was a crushing blow for me because I had to go back to my hometown, Coventry in the UK, face family and friends. Everyone asked me a million questions. God, what happened at Bristol City? How come you're back already? And they couldn't quite work it out. 
Uh, so, and that this, 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 at this point in my, in my life, this, I talk to young people today about players that get released from clubs at 16 and 17. You can either go one way or you go the other. And, you know, I've had experience with a nephew who was at Coventry and then got released at 16 and went on the streets and ended up in fucking prison. So you've got young people that are crushed of that rejection and they don't know how to cope with it. They, they, they've had it easy in terms of being pampered by the football club and, you know, having the kit and the boots and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden they're out of the game. But what, what you can do, and this is, this, this is an education that you'll, under, you, 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 I'll try and make you understand. In the UK, you have professional football and you have semi-professional football, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Semi-professional football is not none of the nine to two football league clubs. The nine to two football league clubs are four divisions is the professional circuit in England. But you have semi-professional football, which are lower teams, which you can have a job as a banker, a postman, whatever your job is, and you'll play for that semi-professional football team. You'll train twice a week. You might get a couple hundred quid a week. Yeah. Um, And you'll hope by playing for that team, you'll get spotted by a scout playing in semi-professional football. So when you, when a young player gets released from Arsenal, Tottenham, wherever it is, um, 17 or whatever, they, they, they can still become a pro if they go to a semi-pro club and work their way back up and have the desire and work hard and hope that they get spotted. Because players like Ian Wright and Les Ferdinand and Jamie Vardy and all these premiership players, they've all come from non-league football. We call it non-league, sorry, non-league football. Yeah, yeah. yeah they've come from non-league football. And that's what a lot of people don't realise. The list is endless of these top strikers and players in the UK that have come from non-league football. Jamie Vardy, who was the top scorer in the Premier League last year, he, he, he was 21 when he came from Fleetwood. You know, Les Ferdinand was 20 from Hayes United. People are thinking, who's Hayes exactly? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Ian Wright, Ian Wright, Ian Wright, Greenwich Borough, before he went to Palace, you know? So I, I had that mindset. And I, I went into non-league, I worked hard, I played for a club called St. Albans City, a really good semi-professional football club. Um, and I eventually got spotted playing for um, St. Albans by Stoke City. And so I turned professional at 21, you know, so it's never too late, never too late. Yeah, well, shit, you were just a kid, though. I couldn't imagine that kind of, A, a kid going out, partying, girls, the whole thing, B, once you get rejected, you're just a, a fucking kid, Tony. At that point, yeah. It's like yeah, I was know? yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's what I mean. Some people sixteen years old, man. Jeez, <laughs> I was, how was I doing at sixteen? Well, I mean, we're still. I was still looking for my first armpit hair. <laughs> I mean, we're still in in secondary school at that point here because we normally go 17, 18. Yeah, Unless you're, yeah. Oh fuck up! It might be nineteen. But. Yeah, yeah. So you, you probably you still waiting for your first kiss, yeah? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Eighth grade. I, I really Eighth grade, Tony. Tony, looking Eighth back, grade. if I write a book, I realize yeah. my shit started way younger, way before I ever touched alcohol. So <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> you know. uh, so that was well, the journey. That was the journey. Um, yeah, of the fo- of the football, obviously from from Stoke City. I had nine years as a professional then. Yeah. Yeah. So what was uh, the, the growing up like? As you mentioned, a sister, five yeah. brothers, uh, you know, I, I, and from what I did a bit of research, especially when, when you grew up, you're, I think, about seven, eight years older than me. Definitely an area that faced a lot of racism and discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. In, in England in the 80s, there, there was a lot of um, racism. Uh, there was a lot of uh, skinhead, skinhead culture um, in, in the UK back then. Um, in terms of England, there wasn't there wasn't that many uh, black footballers, so it was very hard to get into football. You know, today, you know, half the England squad is are, are black players now, so it just shows you how how much time has changed. Uh, but yeah, I had to struggle through that. You know, it wasn't nice getting into fights, etc. Um, but I fought my way through that, and, and I think moving away. Coventry is a <clears throat> big city. It's a big city in the UK, Coventry in the Midlands near Birmingham. Um, but it's a couple of hours from London. And at 18 years old, I decided to move to London from Coventry, mm. uh, where my sister was living as a teacher and moved in with her in a flat in London. And that that sort of move uh, sort of like started my sort of new life and new career in London because I joined the semi professional football club. I've got a job, live with my sister. And, um, you know, the, the racism wasn't as rife as it was in the inner cities. Um, so, yeah, but unfortunately, when I moved to London at 18, uh, I signed for a club called Dulwich Hamlet Football Club. They are a semi-professional football club. And um, 
unfortunately across the road was a bookmakers i'll never forget it mecca bookmakers and we talk about reasons why people start gambling there's lots of different various reasons whether it's trauma uh, whether it's to cope with stress cope with things whether it's advertising promotion as it is today uh, but for me back then it was a bit of peer pressure there was about i was new i came to london london was a big city and big lights and i teamed up with four or five of the players who had little bets uh, at the bookies across the road before matches and I, it was my way of wanting to fit in because of you know see if you can picture it but i've come from coventry with a completely different accent to the cockney londoners and the cockney londoners are cocky um, and, you, and you have to you, you have to fit in you have to you know you, you, get, you, you get the piss ripped out of you you know what i mean so I had, to, I had to be strong mentally but i was young i was 18 i was shy you know so i had to find a way to fit in and when i seen these these guys at 22 23 you know having these bets at the bookmakers across the road I, I just joined in with them i joined in with the click and it was a bit of peer pressure so that sort of made me feel a bit more comfortable and confident and that's how i started the football um coupons gambling and so that was my sort of first bet, yeah, 18 years old. Were you betting on all games, your games? Just no, not, not, not my game, just any any games, all the divisions, yeah, various different games. And, you know, it's like anything, you know, it starts out, like most people, as a bit of fun, as a bit of curiosity. Um, yeah, you want financial reward, but, you know, it's only when it's, it's it slowly starts to escalate. Um, and, and the thing about gambling addiction is that so half the time you don't even know what's really happening. Um, and it's and it, and it grows gradually and then you, you know at some point it will start affecting your your daily life at some point you'll start borrowing money um, at some point it will affect you you know your mental health uh, you'll start missing because I was working at the time you start you know missing work um, because of the way you feel uh, and then eventually slowly you'll get yourself into serious debt um, so yeah the spiral of, of gambling addiction is it's it's it's, it, I would say it's probably a, a gradual thing that takes time. Um, but yeah, before, but the, I would say that at 18 with that gambling, um, by the time I got to 21 and signed for Stoke City, I, didn't, I, wouldn't, I wasn't an addict, but, but I had a problem. Uh, but when I went to Stoke, obviously, hell of a lot more money. But I will, in terms of saying that I had a lot, hell of a lot more money, yes, I did because I was a professional footballer. But it's it's... It is quite irrelevant in terms of how much you earn, you know, because we have people that are on, you know, benefits and students that are still gambling their, their money away and and, and getting gam you know, gambling harm. So that's quite irrelevant. It's just that I did have more money. So my losses were, big, were bigger and my layouts were bigger. And when you get to a place of what we call chasing losses, then you'll you'll put big bets on to try and get yourself e to get yourself e to get yourself even. That's what you're doing. That's what's happening to me. But then, you know, over a period of time, you dig yourself, you dig yourself a bigger hole. And that's what was happening to me. So um, by the time I turned professional in Stoke and signed that three-year contract, um, I was getting into serious debt. But then then I hit the casinos. Uh, and I think hitting the casinos was probably, yeah, the biggest sort of trigger in terms of how the, how the addiction really spiraled out of control. Because I would finish training. We'd start training about 10 o'clock, you know, get home about, you know, it was different to the continent, by the way, English, English professional football then. Times have changed now. You know, now, you know, you might start at 10 o'clock. You won't, you won't, you'd have an afternoon session. There's the gym, you know, different kinds of sessions. So you might not finish till three or four o'clock. But back then you'd be out the ground by one o'clock. And I would either go to the bookies um, or, or I'd go to the casino all day. And then in the evening I'd go to the casino. And this is like Monday to Friday. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was losing a hell of a lot of money and the debt was increasing 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 i was going to the manager asking for subs uh, i borrowed off every single member of my family which is five brothers and a sister um and we talk about it today but we're a very tight-knit family and we talk about it today um about you know the times when you're burdening with your family with, with problems and your friends then eventually that phone that phone stops ringing and your mates stop picking up the phone because they know it's oh he wants another 50 quid so there's so many elements to it <clears throat> that that are attached to gamble addiction uh, and not not just the money, but obviously the mental side of it. So yeah, I was going for a tough time. I never I never spoke to anybody. I never I never once went to a manager of all the six managers that I played for. Not once did I go to a manager uh, to you know open up because you stay in denial. That's that's the sad, yeah that's the sad fact about an addict. You stay in denial. You think that that massive massive win will come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we always do. So yeah. 
in the midst of you losing all this money and becoming more and more in debt, I'm curious as to where your thought process was. Were you just yeah. like, oh, shit, I'm losing a ton of money. This isn't good. I got to win it back. Or did you know in the back of my mind, this isn't good. I got to just stop completely. Yeah. And that's that's the really interesting point, because although you know that you, you've, you've got a, you've got a problem and this is causing a problem, you know, because I'm not sleeping you know, my form is very sporadic with the clubs. I was in and out of the team. Um, so there's lots of things going on around me. And obviously with the debt and the bailiffs and the, and the debt letters that come through the door, getting the car repossessed, all these things. So you know you've got a problem. You know that the gambling is causing this. Right. But, the hard, but the hardest thing is to stop. That is the hardest thing. And that's why we say today that, you know, you have to get professional help. You can't, you, you're not going to wake up in the morning one day and say, I'm going to stop gambling. It, it just doesn't work like that. Um, and so that that's that's why that's why you, you know you continue 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 to hope that and the thing the thing the crazy thing about it even if I did get a big win and got myself level I don't think I would have stopped. It's never enough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I would have stopped. No. Fifty one fifty is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. I yeah. think people, anyone listening would be so fascinating because, you know, you, when you tell your story, Tony, and other people from other forms of addiction and me, myself, with alcoholism, it's just... It's weird how we all think we're so different and unique, and yet addiction is addiction is addiction, you know, and what it does to you, you know, the sleeplessness, the the ruin. I mean, you know, yeah. people, you know, obviously you think people with expensive drugs, you mm -hmm. know, Mikey, you know, it was costly, but hey, even me with the alcohol, I remember counting change just to go in and get a, a you know, a double can here, 24 yeah. ounce can. Just because yeah. I was DT and or whatever it is. And I imagine yeah. psychologically and emotionally, you would go through the same kind of situation if you had no no cash at hand to go and just place a bet or whatever it was. If there was you, you know, do whatever you do, what, whatever it takes. I mean, apart from borrowing of the money, um, I committed a couple of card frauds. Um, I sold obviously possessions. We we have like you do in America, pawnbrokers. So I take whatever I've got to the black and pawnbrokers and sell whatever I've got. You know, you you do whatever you it takes to have that bet. And like I don't know what it's like to be an alcoholic or a drug addict, but I'm presuming, like you say, the addictions are similar. You 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 can't whatever it takes, you will do. Hence why we have a lot of crime with with the, with drug addiction in in the UK, uh, because you know you have to have that first bet. The first thing you think about in the morning, as far as I'm concerned, is having about when does the book is open. You know, they stay open later over the last few years. Now you stay in there till early evening. You know. It's a, it's a cycle that's very, very difficult to break. That's, that's the way I would describe it. It's very, very difficult to break that cycle. Yeah? And to, unless you get uh, two things, really. One, you need professional help. But two, you've got to be committed to want help. Yeah. You know, you actually yeah. got to want help, you know. And like most people and most gambling addicts, you don't seek help until what we call rock bottom. You know, that's, gem that's generally when you seek help. For you, was it solely sports betting? You also mentioned the casinos as well. And if I remember correctly, on the cover yeah. of your book, there's a roulette table. Uh, roulette, <laughs> roulette, roulette killed me. Not, not, yeah. actually, not literally. I'm, I'm still here. It didn't kill me literally. <laughs> yeah. But but roulette was just evil. You know that I got addicted to the casino, and roulette was the game. Um, roulette was your thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I hated roulette. I, I got in trouble for cut. They were like, "Sir, you got to stop cussing. You got to stop yelling so loud." I'm like, "I just lost a hundred dollars in twenty seconds. Give me a freaking yeah. break." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they say that about the um, the shop staff in, in the book is about they should they should intervene uh, when someone's losing money on the machine or whatever. But you know, the shop staff are scared of of um, repercussions and violence. Like you just said, if you tell a punter that, oh, you know, you've got to come out and stop, or you've got to stop gambling now because you've got, they'll just go mad because they've just lost five hundred pound in ten minutes. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the casino, the <clears throat> the casinos uh, was the yeah, the biggest downfall. Big, big, big losses in the casino. Um, I mean, we talk about intervention now. You know, we'll, we'll touch upon it a bit later about the gambling industry, how it works here, and how they can intervene, and what what certain things should be in place that are not being done. Uh, but 
Yeah, the, 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 I think the denial factor is the thing that, you know, I say to people now that if, if it starts to cause an issue, an issue on a daily basis, if you start borrowing money, if it's causing you serious health problems like sleeping and depression, you know, that's when you know you've got to say, right, I've got to go and speak to somebody. It might be a family, a friend, it might be an employer, but yeah. you've got to get professional yeah. help because that's otherwise, you know, otherwise, unfortunately, in the UK, I'm not sure what America's like, but we have approximately 650 gambling related deaths per year, and that's growing. So suicide is now a, a big part of gambling addiction in the UK. We had a documentary three days ago on our main channel uh, about suicide and gambling. So <clears throat> people are starting to sort of wake up and realise how deep this gambling addiction uh, issue is. Right. Yeah, all of these matters that just can lead to a terrible, terrible mm. downfall. Did you, yeah. uh, in your, in your post, uh, um, I want to ask, you know, what was your point in what you recognized and got help, but in getting help, have you kind of done backtracking of, of boy, what really triggered gambling addiction? I mean, I know you mentioned that desire to to fit in, but yeah, yeah. you know, mm. were you kind of as a kid a bit of an outcast, or you know, mm. did you fall on a certain point in the family, like the youngest of all the children, or middle? And you yeah. know, I, I know for me, I did a lot of unraveling. It's like, okay, my addiction makes sense now. Not only family history, but yeah. other yeah. traumas that occurred. Yes, it's an interesting point because I, I, with my team at Red Card, um, three of them are counsellors and psychotherapists. Now, we, I talk to them about the addiction per se and, and, and what it actually means and, and how people get addicted and why people get addicted. And one of the things they do always say is that a lot of addiction stems from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I say to them, well, my childhood, I couldn't have had a better childhood, you know, Mum and dad, five brothers, didn't want for anything. The perfect childhood, no trauma whatsoever. And so that sort of counts that out. But, but obviously, you know, it's, it's different for different people. Um, so when I look back about, you know, how, how I, how this gambling addiction, you know, escalated, whether I think back to the first bet, yeah, trying to fit in and all that. But beyond that, I can't sort of put my finger on any particular reason why, why I actually got addicted and why I became a compulsive gambler. Because, the, the strange thing is, which is a fact anyway, and it's the same all over the country, all over the world, sorry, is that there's thousands and thousands uh, of people that gambling that gamble without ever encountering gambling harm. That it's never causes a problem, you know, and, and that's and that's the that's the tricky bit where you which you can't. Yeah, you might you might have a, a point to say on that because I, I can't sort of work out what, what why that is. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I. Gambling, not a thing, but you put a beer in front of me, see you in two weeks, you know, and it's so yeah, just yeah. weird how our brains work, you yeah. know, for each individual. I each was individual, yeah. Exactly. I was uh, actually recently out of town for a friend's get together and there was a casino and I, I lost uh, probably like 80 to 100 bucks in like five minutes. And I was thinking of everything I could have done with the hundred dollars. I literally just walked in, handed them a hundred dollars, and then just <laughs> yeah. left. It's like, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> like, no offense yeah. to people who, yeah, but, because but, they but can Mikey, look at alcoholics and be like, what? Just don't drink. It's yeah. that, yeah, you know, but Mikey, I mean? yeah, but Mikey, you, you just made an interesting point. You've just gone in and given them a hundred pounds or lost a hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. But for thousands of people, they have to get that hundred pound back. Yeah, no, something, absolutely. Something triggers them; they have to get it back. Sure, sure. They yeah, can't no. walk out and say, "No, I've lost hundred pound. Leave that. I'm gonna leave that fucking shit alone. I'm walking out." They, a lot of people can't do that. They have to get it back. Oh, and, and I totally, starts. I totally get that. Like, I wanted to get it back, but I was just like, "No, no, no!" Yeah. Like, because yeah, these yeah, places yeah. are big and beautiful for yeah. you know not giving money away. So yeah. it's just yeah. like. Yeah, but, I, but I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a very, it's very, um, some obviously there's, you touched upon about how the brain works. We're all wired up differently. Absolutely. We talk about the uh, talk of how the dopamine has an effect on your behavior. So there's lots of, you know, biological issues going on. But, you know, it's just weird how some people who just, I've got friends that, that gamble, never a problem, never a problem. But then I've got uh, that, you know, serious problem. So, it's different for everybody. You know, I'm not sure about this. In, uh, addictive people say that some people have an addictive personality. I don't know. Could be. I don't know. Well, and it goes both ways, too. Like, Jason, how he had mentioned how mine was substance abuse. So, like, cocaine, when I ran out, I wanted more. I, want, I couldn't sleep. I'd be up for days at a time. 
you yeah. would probably look at me and be like, dude, stop doing it and go the fuck to bed. You know, what yeah. I mean? yeah. I'd be like, yeah. it's not that easy. I want not that easy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's why I'm saying I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not that easy, here, buddy. Yeah. But that's mm-hmm. the interesting thing, too, that you really talk about, Tony, that, that just the psychological ramifications, you know, mm-hmm. the emotional state it leaves you in. You, too, yeah. you, you know, restless and everything else. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, and I would assume being a fierce competitor, because, you know, if you're if you're out there on the pitch and you're making a living at it, you're a fierce competitor. There's yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. no, oh, well, I, you know, no need to slide tackle that guy because his mom is nice. And, you know, it's like, no, you're going to fucking get the ball away yeah. however you can, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like when I talk about that's part of, you know, a lot of gamblers make up that competitive nature. Um, and that, and obviously I had that with my profession. That's why a lot of sports people get, get addicted. Well, they say that's why a lot of sports people you know, get addicted to gambling because of their competitive nature, their, their need to win. I guess um, so. Mm, yeah, it's really interesting, uh, but the the ramifications. Yeah, I think that's that, that's why I was pleased that there was a, a documentary on UK TV three days ago about which really highlighted the suicide because I think um, when we talk about issues, social issues in the UK, a lot of a lot of the time, uh, drugs and alcohol will be mentioned. You know, when you go to the GP for as an example, when you go to the GP with you know sleep deprivation or depression, you know they'll ask you, oh, are you taking drugs or do you, you, you drink? But they won't ask you to gamble. And that's one of the things we're, talk, we're, we're talking about now in the UK, about getting GPs educated so they can spot the signs, they can ask the right questions, and they can diagnose people that have come into their surgery with serious health issues and mental health issues that are stemming from gambling, you know, because that's, that's a really big thing that's going on at the moment. Yeah, uh, general practitioner for those that are wondering. GP. Yes, there, there yeah. you go, general <laughs> practitioner. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. let's talk about it. You use the term uh, the, uh, rock bottom for you. Where is the point, Tony, that you just went? Because you lost about half a million pounds. Half a million, including the house, yeah. Yeah, over that nine-year period. <clears throat> yeah, um, and this, and lots of, lots of people um, have different journeys. Lots of people recover differently. Uh, there's not one size fits all. And my, in terms of rock bottom, I always, I always, cause I speak to people within, uh, within the sector about suicide, about well, there's one or two people I know families, I know lost their sons to gambling addiction. And I never, um, although I was depressed and although I was on medication, although I'd lost everything and, and the debt and fell out with friends and family members, all these things that happened is um, whether I'm blessed or what, I don't know, but we'll come onto my faith again soon, but I never got to a point I could honestly say that I never got to a point where I thought I'm going to kill myself. You know, whether that's, whether that's, I'm, I'm, I wasn't meant to go down that road. I don't know whether God spared me for, 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 the, for the new journey, maybe, mm-hmm. but others have, others have, have, others have got to that crossroad where unfortunately that there's no, there's a point of no return. So I had every element um, in terms of the damage it done to me, but it was just fortunate. I never got to the point where I wanted to take my life, but obviously, as we know, you know, many, many do. Uh, and the rock, so rock bottom, I would say that 2010 um, is when I went bankrupt. Uh, so I had a £192,000 bankruptcy file, which was 32 creditors. So every fucking loan shark or you know, bank or pawnbroker, everything on there. Um, and that was a sort, I wouldn't say it was a start, but it, it, I was still gambling after the bankruptcy. But the difference was I couldn't get credit because it stays on your credit. I don't know why it's like in the US. But you get a bankruptcy in the UK, it stays on your credit file for six years. You can't get credit. So oh, that was fine because I didn't want credit. Um, but it stays on your credit file. So if you go to a, for a job and they ask you, have you ever been declared bankrupt? That's, then obviously it's caused you problems. Um, but so I went that wiped out the hundred ninety two thousand pound debt. Um, but then here's the here's the bit which I wanted to tell you how it. I'd say how it got to where I am today is that. A year later, I was working for Network Rail, which is a railway organisation in the UK. Um, I was in my signal box and working away on a Sunday afternoon, really quiet. And I had a visitor. Now, I'd been at Network Rail for 10 years now because that's the career I went into after football. Uh, So I had a visitor on a Sunday afternoon, really quiet. And uh, I didn't recognise him. We're not allowed visitors. You work alone. The only person I might get is a regional manager or something. But I didn't recognise this person. He's about 50-something. And um, 
I said, oh, yeah, how can I help you? And he said, oh, I'm the local uh, network rail chaplain. I said, okay. I said, well, I've been here 10 years and I've never met a network rail chaplain. Showed me his ID, um, seemed genuine enough. And uh, he, ha- he actually had a Bible in his hand, brand, brand new Bible. And um, so I let him in. We sat down in a signal box. Um, and this was the point where the bankruptcy had just finished. Uh, my 20 year relationship with a partner was just coming to an end. And obviously, you know, my life was still a bit of a mess. Um, so we sat down and talked and straight away within within five minutes, he wrote out what I now know is called a salvation prayer. We said that together. Um, and then we talked about where I'm at. And then we talked about the future, um, read a few scripts, scriptures, sorry. And um, and then he left after two hours. Now, it wasn't a case of when he left and when I finished work that day, that the next day and that everything was rosy and things are going to be great. It wasn't all that at all. But it was a great, when I look back now, I can see how gradual it was and I can see what steps were being put in place. This, this is really, really from a personal point of view. So 2012, 13, which is 18 months later, is when I told you when this idea of writing a book came. And I said to you that I wouldn't know where to start to write a book. So although I was still gambling, but not heavy, because I didn't have the credit and all that, um, I started to sort of see a bit of hope. And when the book was released, that's when I really saw hope because I was finished the book, the book came out. Um, and then I was setting up this organization with some support. Lots of people came to support me, which is, was a bit strange because people will come from all over, you know, just wanted to get on board with Red Car, wanted to help me. Governance, setting up the organization with directors, getting a team of counselors together. It was, you know, it was it was hard work, but there was just so many people that wanted to support me. Yeah. So and this is what I call the people that God brought into my life. So what happened then? I had I had a, a friend in Coventry who had this business gala dinner going on. Um, big event, annual event in Coventry. And she said, oh, your book's just come out um, and we've got a problem with we're down a speaker. And uh, would you come and share your story for 15 minutes? 250 people, big gala dinner in this hotel. And when she said it, my heart sank because I never did public speak in my life. You know what I mean? so, so I'm, think, I'm, I'm thinking, shit, fucking hell, can I do this? So uh, uh, something triggered and just said, uh, just go and do it. You know what I mean? So I got a table with eight members of my family. Um, and when I did that talk for 15 minutes, that that was it. And that's when I knew in my heart, that's when I knew that this is, this is God's putting you on a new journey now that you're going to be going on from this. Because lots of people in the audience coming up to me afterwards, talking about my story, talking about their mum and dad's finding their betting slims in the bin, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so I knew it it resonates with a lot of people. I knew how big a, the gambling addiction was. Um, and I felt, you know, although I was, you know, I, I shit myself before I went on stage. But, you know, <laughs> I, but, but, but I, 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 I thought, you know, the people, the comments afterwards, just saying that you're, you're a natural. And then after that, obviously, like I said, I went on BBC Breakfast and the comments on that, you're a natural. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, there's something that's changed here. I can't put my finger on it. And I'm saying to myself, there's something that's changed here. You're, you're now going to go out and educate people, which if you would have asked me, you know, two or three years previous, I would have just laughed in your face. And if you would have said, you're going to head up an organisation, you're going to go and educate people, you're going to do public speaking, you're going to write books. Well, I'd say you must be fucking mad. But, <laughs> but it's just crazy how, how, how the look, in my opinion, again, sorry, uh, and I respect everyone's faith and religion, uh, but that's what I think that yeah. God has put into little, little building blocks to where we are now. Yeah. It's interesting how the thing that kind of is a, our damnation, so to speak, can end up being a part of our salvation and our gift back to the world. And yeah, you know, and, it, and, a, and a spiritual awakening, which, you know, for anyone watching, listening, I mean, it's such a huge part of, you know, NAAA Gamblers Anonymous or what, you know, it's that that spiritual progress. And yeah. Spiritual perfection. Yeah. And it's it's a key component for our sobriety, yeah. for whatever it is. Yeah. A lot of people go to GA and, you know, the 12 step program and, you know, there's a a spiritual religious element to that and you know that's that helps them whether whatever the higher power is that they believe in so for me it's christianity for me um and i just go back to uh after that book was um written the first book red car and i've done that talk and the set of the organization the first workshop that we set up was a local one a regional one in our area and we were looking for somewhere to to um do the workshop our first one uh, open event and so uh again it's weird someone said contact the local church or contacted the local church 
I went down there. Um, his house is right next to the church and uh, Father Tamer. And he said, oh, I had the book with me and was sat in his house with, with his two kids and his wife. And he said, your story is amazing. I said that, you know, he said, we want to support your organization. You can have the f- hall for free, which is normally about 500 quid. You can have it for free. Uh, we'll give you a donation to help you on your way. Um, and so they became our first sponsor. So it's all connected. Yeah. It's just all, it's all connected. And they became my church of worship. And um, yeah, from that moment onwards, it was just a matter of, you know, God giving me the tools and me me using the tools and making sure that I stay on the right path and, you know, try to try to educate people, which, yeah. And we grown, we've grown from, I would say, we're active in terms of going out to the public, uh, in terms of the educational workshops, we've grown. We, we were active from about 2017, um, so to where we are now and continue to grow. Yeah, awesome. that seems very cool. I love it. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some uh, some football stories. Uh, you yeah. to, to tell us some good memories. I mean, we you know we love talking two... sports, even if we don't know yeah. a ton about yeah. sports. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story. I'll tell you a funny yeah. one. I'll go on. Go on, Mike. What was going to say? Oh, I was going to say I saw a footballer, and I was like, "Cool, which NFL team is that?" But then I forget <laughs> that it was. <laughs> so yeah, let's hear it, man. Let's hear some stories. Yeah. So the, uh, the 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 I'll tell you the the funny the, no yeah the funny one first. So in, in England, obviously, you've got different divisions, uh, the top tier, the Premier League, and then you have Championship, second tier, and then Division One and Division Two. So I was, this is on my downward spiral of my career. Um, so I'm now at Berry Football Club um, in the third tier of professional football. And um, because my form was so sporadic, I was this was at all the clubs, my form was sporadic. I was always in and out of the team because of what was going on. And so this particular team I was playing for, they... The manager got pissed off with me, so he dropped me and, and he signed another player from another club and he played in my position, right wing. So one Saturday afternoon at a match, uh, what happens when, you, when, when he calls the squad out and all that? The squad travels together to the game um, and then the ones that are not playing are sitting in the, in the stand uh, with, with the directors and the chairman. And uh, yeah, you watch the game and, you, and you're sitting there in your suit. So I'm sitting there in my suit with about three or four of my players, teammates that were in the squad that are not playing. And... Um, I'm watching this guy on the pitch. Yeah, that's taken my place. So every time he, he touches the ball, I'm like, you fucking shit, you fucking wank. I'm just, I'm just cussing him. I'm just cussing him. And remember, there's four or 5,000 people in the crowd. I'm in the main stand. And people are, people are you know, looking around. And my mates are saying to me, Tony, the chairman's behind you. The chairman's behind you, though. But I didn't give a shit. I, I didn't give a shit. So I just kept cussing this guy. Kevin Hume, his name was. And I kept cussing him. And... Um, and so I didn't think nothing of it. The chairman, obviously, right behind me, obviously heard everything. I did, but I didn't care because that's that was my mindset. I was just pissed off. I didn't care. So um, we come to Monday morning now, yeah, Monday morning. And every Monday morning, at every football club, you have a briefing, yeah, with the weekend. So he sits us down in the dressing room, all in a in a square in the dressing room, just to have a briefing about Saturday's match. Um, and then before he starts, he goes, "Right, guys, um, there was an unsavoury incident on Saturday." Um, in, at the match on Saturday, and um, uh, the two guys, the two guys know know who they are. Uh, so he looks at Ke- Kevin's across the dressing room of me, so he's sort of looking at me. And uh, Mike Walsh manager goes, so uh, he goes, you two, you two go and sort it out in the gym. Now Kevin Hume is six foot something and built like a fucking brick shit house, yeah. <laughs> so, right, so when so, so when Mike Walsh manager said you two go and sort it out in the gym. My heart just sank because I just thought, this, that's it. I'm just going to be fucking battered. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, when I think about it. You just take it, off running. <laughs> no, 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 I can I just, outrun so, this. I, you I, could beat I, me up, but I could outrun you. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought in my head, in, as soon as he said it, I knew, obviously, I knew what Mike Walsh meant, sort it out. Um, so he wants us to have a rock, right? Which is not good management anyway. Right, I still can't believe. Yeah, I still can't believe he said that. But yeah, so the players are all are all thinking, "Fucking hell, good luck, Tony." Sort of thing. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I, so I, um, I, in my head, all I was thinking, and this is, and you know, you, sometimes you just got to be honest and hold your hands up. And and this is a point where I don't mind telling you guys. I tell my friends and everything about it because it's just honest. I am. You know, if if I'm if I'm a chicken or a fucking cow, I'll, I'll tell you. And at this particular moment, I was. And I said in my head, I was thinking, right. When we get into this gym, I've got to think about what I can say before he fight, throws that first punch. So we got into the gym and I goes, Kev, 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 listen, listen. 
I'm genuinely really, really sorry. I didn't mean any harm. I said, I know I was out of order. I'm really sorry. Listen, mate, it's, I'm just pissed off. I'm not in the team. You know, you've signed for Berry now. I said, look, it's nothing against you. Trust me. And I just went on and on and on and rambled. And he's just and he's just staring at me with his fucking fist clench and all that. But you know, it worked. It worked. He just said, Tony, look, just forget it. Just fucking forget it. <laughs> and I remember, I remember when we walked out and into the dressing room, we got chance. And in the warm-up, when you're jogging around the pitch in the warm-up, the players were just comments just coming out. Fucking hell, I'm, I'm glad I'm surprised you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys like was that? You said it was poor management and you still can't believe that he said that. But was that common? If you guys had an issue, you would just go fight it out in the gym? Or was that the only time that that's happened for you? That was the only, that's the only time for me that that's happened. But generally, oh, in the in the, in the the English dressing room, professional football, there's been lots and lots of fights. Oh, lots oh, of fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's been a lot, of, a lot of fights on the training ground, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about this. Well, because you well. were playing, this was what, late 80s at this point? Late 90s. Late 90s. Okay. Because yeah. you had a... Uh, was it 14 years? How long did you play? Played for nine years, 1990 to 99. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, as a pro, and then obviously uh, 1982 to 84 as a, as a 16 to 18 year old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that so, was, uh, yeah, go on. With the fights being, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhat common, I'm curious have you ever seen a Green Street hooligan? Yes. Okay, so is that a real thing too? Like every soccer club has a firm and they all yes. meet each other? That's yeah. real. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's absolutely um they still have the firms today, but because there's so much cameras and so much police about now, time's moved on a bit. So and there's a lot of, and all that. Good yeah, stuff. yeah. Everything's yeah. yeah, okay. Everything's changed out. But back then there were specific firms, you know, the Chelsea's, the Arsenal's, the Tottenham's, the Millwalls, specific firms. And the, the thing about these firms, because I knew one or two of them, the thing about these firms are uh, some of the guys you would never think are hooligans. You know, they have work, they work in a top bank or something like that. But come Saturday afternoon, their their whole life changes. You know, they're oh, yeah. going to yeah, they're going to football specifically to have a run, you know, and that's how it was back in the eighties. It was it's actually nuts. You know yeah. what? I get it because we have it. We we have a great job. You know, we're yeah. we're nice. We're nice guys. We're nice guys. Yeah. But on yeah. football Sunday, oh, when my Niners are playing, when my yeah. 49ers are playing and they lose. Yeah. Don't talk to me. Don't come anywhere near me. Nobody call me. Don't text me. Yeah. I don't want to talk to nobody. <laughs> so, I yeah. get the passion. I yeah. understand yeah. the passion for a team. The soccer. Yeah. Team. Well, for yeah. me, Tony, I'm a big motorsports guy. Uh, my right. favorite driver, Lewis Hamilton. Now, right. when I was right. drinking and Lewis would lose or something like he did last weekend where he went off yeah. the track and could have won, yeah. Yeah. I would have lost my shit. But now I'm just kind of like, well, that's racing, you know, but before it's like, what the Boy. fuck? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, could you, could like you... that completely sober. That's yeah. that's the passion. I'll, I'll be completely sober and just be like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things off the wall. But the thing, the thing is, like you said, but for a thousand, especially, yeah, with the same in the US, the same as the UK, thousands of sports fans, to them, it is their, it's their weekend. It's a massive part of their life. If sure. their team loses, they go to work on Monday, you know, depressed. It's a big part of their life for some supporters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and there's, it, I noticed when I was there um, in England, even, although brief, uh, there's definitely a different camaraderie than there is here. I mean, the, the, I would say the fanatic, it's more yeah. fanatic there than here to a certain extent although i see it pretty crazy with american football and i have been to games where i've seen idiots get into fights but yeah not, not to the movement that like i've seen ripping with, your head off yeah yeah, yeah not, not with, yeah not like ripping your head off yeah exactly i don't know man when the 49ers play the raiders those fights get pretty intense i was well, yeah. it's very okay. terrifying <laughs> well yeah. and, i mean we've had people killed outside of stadiums which That's, i'm yeah. still there too oh, yeah yeah you know, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, back in the 80s, there was knives and everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, oh, fucking that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I got to ask a professional footballer this question. Wouldn't it make more sense if American football was called soccer? Because it kind of sounds more like what American football does. Because we hardly use our feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't the term soccer sound a little more like, ah, you know, slamming into each other? No. Whereas yeah, football... I would I would call it tackle. Oh yeah, I don't know soccer. why you call it football. Yeah, <laughs> which which is the most popular one out of them too. Anyway, football, football, and um, because you've got the three th the three sports in the US that I you know I, I watch the NBA a lot. 
So right. in terms of in terms of uh, public or support or money, whatever it is, is it football, which you call US football, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or is it baseball or is it basketball? Uh, they, football, they all earn they all earn millions and millions of dollars. Fucking they, hell. they all do, and that's kind of tough because if you ask me, I'm gonna probably say football, even though baseball is considered America's pastime. I don't really oh, care for baseball. Yeah, I, it's boring. Yeah. It's a game of catch that gets American football is yeah. the is the most watched sport. Most watched, yeah. right? That's so, the most watched, which probably makes a little more sense. You know, only games with uh, you know. Uh, there's Thursday night, then Sunday and Monday, there's right? Thursday, Sunday, Monday. So, you know, there's but then right. you got basketball that's on every damn day, especially during the playoffs right now. Yeah. Uh, oh, I love NBA. Right oh, I do I too. I, and I love this time of year because playoffs, it's game after game after game. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It sucks because my team's not in it, but whatever. Yeah. But I, I think the nature of American football is that the games, there's only so few within a year, whereas NBA, you know, I don't even remember what the regular season is now. It used to yeah, be 82. Yeah. Baseball, there's a hundred and 50 something so, oh yeah wow. baseballs you know wow. there's so, so many baseball games uh because yeah. for for uh um like premier league and stuff it's it's normally during season one a week right it's just weekend one a week so, but but there are midweek games as well you have about 10 midweek games during the season mm-hmm. then the rest every saturday yeah mm. okay yeah well, i guess to answer your question it would be football yeah. american football. yeah american football is the biggest mm-hmm. watch yeah yeah, yeah. Long in answer, short of, question. What about, yeah. <laughs> what about, this is a tricky one. What about finance then? Because when I listen to some of the contracts these NBA players get, it's just mind boggling. I mean, uh, it's kind of hard to talk about or to justify it now because there's not, I mean, they're starting to open up the stadiums more. It's not full capacity, but. Well, I he's mean, asking about contracts. Yeah, players. Yeah, the yeah, players no, they're getting there. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> so yeah. with the stadiums not having people, NBA is not bringing in that much money. And I know the views are down because it's boring to watch it at home with no fans because it sounds like a scrimmage. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So with yeah. the money not coming in, I don't know how these players are still making the millions and millions that they yeah. do, but it's they incredible. are. But, they you are. know, you got to figure jersey sales and all that. So, yeah. I mean – Sure well, I would say one. NBA probably the 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 highest average probably paid, average, or like as far rate. as as far as the amount of big people and of course you'll, we'll get some of those big baseball contracts. What was it like? Yeah. Pujols was one hundred and fifty million or something I, I, yeah, crazy. It's, you know what I mean? it's crazy. I know nothing about baseball. I have no yeah. idea. It's like <laughs> yeah, and I know it happens in football. Generally, genu- gen- generally, the word I could say, quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Are oh, yeah. ones quarterbacks are the highest. Quarterback is it? All right. Okay. Yeah. Are, they're the heartbeat of the team. They're the ones who right. they're the lead. They're essentially the leader of the team is the quarterback. So it's understandable. It makes so sense. is the quarterback the one the one where if you throw it, he has to catch it. No, the quarterback's the one throwing it. Oh, he's the one that throws it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So the one catching it would be the wide receiver who they get right. paid. I actually think the second highest paid in the NFL is the defensive line. I oh. think. I know the defensive line and linebackers, they get paid a lot. Then it might come the wide receivers on offense. Yeah. And all that. I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to learn a bit more about American football. Yeah. Come visit well, over I, here, man. We'll take you to a game. <laughs> I go to yeah. Niner games every year. Yeah. Well, you, I tell you, you never know what's, what life holds. I could be in America. I'm definitely going to be looking at you guys, but you never know. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah, Absolutely, that. man. We'd love yeah, to definitely. have you here. Yeah, definitely. I've um, never been to London. I do. It's England's awesome. I wish I could have stayed longer. I was only there for two days. And that's two days, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I've been to Florida, obviously, with, with my daughter and the Disney and all that stuff, Florida. Yeah, and yeah. I've been and I've, and I've been to Brooklyn for a weekend. My auntie lives in Brooklyn, so I went to that, yeah, weekend. Oh. Went to down, yeah, went to a, to a couple of clubs around there. What's the Billy Billy something club? In Manhattan, oh, I can't remember now. I'm yeah, not but, familiar with the East yeah, Coast. So, yeah. yeah, so I was down there. But yeah, but the one thing I would say about America, which which we always say in England, everything's bigger. So you come to every, everything, whether it's the food or the burgers, whether it's the roads, whether it's the cars, everything is bigger. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah this is true. <laughs> we, it, it, especially depending on where you're at. Well, if you go to Texas, I was one, they love that. everything bigger, and we won't right. we won't get off into that conversation. <laughs> right, okay. Everything's yeah. bigger in Texas. Oh, yeah. shit, so I'd say, I know you want to you want to watch the time. So I'll say the biggest of two highlights. I would say of my football career. One is when we played. So we have you have the FA Cup. And you have the League Cup, obviously the, the bigger Cup, Champions League, I said, but Stoke City got into the League Cup final 
uh, and we won. And that was a, my first time and only time that I played at Wembley. And when I say Wembley, awesome. this is this is 1992, and I call it the real Wembley. A lot of fans in the UK call the old Twin Towers the real Wembley because that was the problem. I know we got a nice stadium now still, but it's the old Wembley was just something special. Yeah, so to play her there in a final, get a winner's medal, family up there, that was a big highlight. We won one nil. Yeah. yeah, so playing at Wembley, and then. Um, as you're probably aware, a, a particular special moment when I uh, was playing for Stoke. So we drew Liverpool in the cup. Um, obviously, they were favourites, obviously. They had, you know, Matt Manaman, John Barnes, all these players, Grobola and Gold, obviously. So uh, we're 2 1 down, and I was on the bench. And Lou Macari, he's ex Scotland and Man United, uh, he said to me, go and warm up. Uh, and it's 88th minute, and uh, at Anfield, and I'm just one of them things where you just hope, you know, something may happen. You know, I've only got fucking two minutes, maybe. You know, but as soon as I came on the pitch, I remember we had a corner and then I did a sort of sort of scissor kick type kick, went just over the bar. And that was my first touch. Right. Got back to the halfway line, you know, goal kick and all that. And then the next attack, uh, there was a through ball. And then me and Gary Ablett, Gary Ablett has since passed away. He was the Liverpool centre half. And um, me and Gary Ablett got on a chase and then I'm through. And, and when, when I think back now about how I felt when I was through, knowing that I've got 7,000 Stoke fans behind the goal, and I'm now, it's me and Grobola, and there's a question that's asked of me about this particular goal to this day. And uh, and so I, I, I sort of fought with it for a few years, yeah, but then I, then I thought, you know what, no. So the ball's bouncing, it's through ball, Grobola's coming out, it's me and him, and I've side-footed it. With a great connection, straight through his legs, straight in the back of the net. Uh, Stoke City fans going absolutely mental. Um, we're all going mad. It's 2-2, last minute, and we get a great result at Anfield. But people say, did you mean to put it through his legs? You know, and uh, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I, I have to be, you know, I'm going to say I'll probably be on it. I maybe went to side foot it to his left. But I've got a great connection. It, it went straight in the back of the net. Who cares? Fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, no. And I remember that night, because it was midweek game, Wednesday night, uh, we were in Liverpool. We got back to Stoke-on-Trent about midnight. Uh, my family came down, cousins, and so we went to this nightclub. And I just remember going into the nightclub, because Stoke City fans are fanatical, and it's just like bedlam, singing out my name, buying all the drinks, and just the crowd. I can't remember what happened after that or who, who, I, who I ended up with. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it was a just... It was just a mental night. And uh, next day, phone didn't stop ringing, press and all that stuff. So that particular, you know, experience, uh, people say to me now, oh, you're still dining on, dining out on it now. You know, I suppose I am. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll tell you what does, what does happen a lot is I get a lot of um, people, kids that were 16, 17 at the time behind the goal that are now 40s, 50s and just saying what a great, on social media, I get lots of messages about that. I was behind the goal that night and that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, great experience. That was probably the happiest time in terms of uh, my football career, scoring at Anfield and playing at Wembley. Yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. awesome. Hell yeah. I mean, you know, one of the renowned stadiums, you know. Yeah. Uh, Wembley's where... Oh, what was it? Well, like no, ten, tennis is there and every... I don't remember if what, Live was, Aid was... Was Live Aid Wembley. at Wembley? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was. That's how... All that's big, why that's Live Aid, yeah. Like all the big concerts, there, everything's at Wembley, yeah. New York and there, yeah. Uh, SummerSlam '92 was there. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I'm a professional I wasn't thinking of that at geek. all. I was thinking of Freddie oh, Mercury. Right. You said Wembley. I thought Queen. That's what uh, I yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all the big boys have played there. Yeah. Before we get to the fun random questions and give you the last word, if people want to find out more about um, the Red Card uh, Gambling Support yeah. Project. Yeah. How do they go about doing so? Um, so. The website is Kelly's Red Card Consultancy. uk. But even if they even if they Google Red Card Gambling Sport Project, there's pages of stuff about Red Card. Um, lots of information on there. Lots of uh, prevention tools on there. Lots of there's videos on there. Uh, obviously, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and uh, LinkedIn, Tony Kelly. So that not not hard to find. Uh, and I always say to people that if they want to reach out to me through social media or through the website because we have contact details on the website as well, phone number and email. Then don't be afraid to reach out, even if it, even if it's just for a chat or for advice or support, no problem at all. Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. Right on, Mikey. Some random questions with Mr. Kelly. All right. Let's... Oh no. no, these are just fun. 
These are fun just for shits and giggles. Have a laugh. <laughs> if they were to make a movie about you, who would you choose or who would you cast to play you? Oh, um, I know I know that because one of my favorite actors. Uh, and obviously he has to be black. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying you wouldn't cast me. Okay. <laughs> so uh, is, well, is, I hope I've got his first name right. Je Fox, James Fox. Is his first oh, name Oh, Jamie Fox? Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Oh, Jamie yeah. Fox could play anybody. That right. guy, he, yeah, that's why I think he can play anybody. He's lit. He's incredible. I love Jamie Fox. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you were stuck on a deserted island and you could have one movie and one music album, what would they be? Which ones would you bring with you? One movie, one music album. Um, the it's funny, it's funny they're both American. Because uh, you guys do things best, to be fair, right? I would go for um, Alicia Keys ah. would be the, the album because she's got just a, I love her, her the way she plays the piano, and I love her, her mellow voice, and I love some of the nice mellow tracks that she does. So they could just relax in the, on the island with her with her album, yeah. yeah. And with her, with her, she joins me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're stranded on an island, you would need to relax from not freaking out. So that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Alicia Keys, and uh, this this film is is obviously it's an old film, yeah. But it's just something that's there's certain parts in the film that make me laugh, and um, this particular actor makes me laugh. So when I say the name of the actor, you'll know who I mean. So Joey Pescu makes me laugh in this film. And it's a legendary film. So I don't know if you guys can guess it. You would probably know more than me. He's the film He's, buff here. We are, we are talking, obviously, gangsters back in the day. Joey Pescu yeah. with, his, with his little trio. There's three of them in the film. They're always in the same film together. What's his De Niro, name? Niro, De Niro, oh, Joe Pesci. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Joe Pesci, but De Niro, and the other one. There's three of them that are fucking... Is, all, Goodfellas. Are we going Goodfellas? That's it. This? That's the one. Okay. Yeah, my yeah. top three favorite movies is Goodfellas. Yeah. That's love it. Yeah, because you were love saying it. that, but then I was going to think ironically if it was Casino. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's similar. Exactly. <laughs> That'd yeah. be really yeah. ironic. Yeah, but I just I mean, love I love Joey and I love Robert De Niro. I, I, I'm brilliant. obsessed yeah. with Robert De Niro. I, yeah. I anything he does, I love it. Yeah. Um, when you're stopped in traffic, yeah, what's going through your head? What's going from my head? Fucking yeah. hurry up and get a move on. <laughs> <laughs> do you have road rage? Road rage, do you? I, I, I have I have road rage, but but in the car. So I don't I don't I don't get out of the car because oh, um, right. yeah, no, because you know there was an incident where I had with, with my daughter in the car where someone cut me up and um she was the car was cut me up and then he, we're in traffic, so he's he's at an angle in front of me, he's just barred, uh -huh. you know, cut me up. And um my daughter said, "Oh, Dad, look what, he's, look what he's just done! Look at him! Look at him like, with his big fucking car! What's he fucking doing?" But in my in my head, I turned around to my daughter and said, "You know, I said, you know why I'm not doing nothing, and you know why I'm not getting out of the car." I said, "Because you're here." That's what I said to her, and uh, yeah. she she got it. She got it because who knows what's gonna happen when I get out of the car. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just you sometimes just have to take a minute and think, as, as frustrating as it is. Yeah. Jason can vouch for me. I I have. I'm, I have a little bit of road rage, a little bit. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm very irritable on the freeway with dumb drivers because I drive a lot. So <laughs> there's an I'm abundance of irritable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if we're in a three lane and you're in front of me and you're only going 60 and you're not yeah. in the middle lane or the slow lane and nobody else is there, I'm right. going yeah. to make it a point to know yeah. that you pissed me off. So I'll get yeah. on the yeah. side of you. I'll get in front of you. I might slow down a little bit just to piss you off as much yeah, as yeah, I, yeah. I, I could be very petty. I could be very yeah. petty. But I, know, but I know what I mean. I don't like that middle lane fucking slow driving shit. Yeah. 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 I, if you I, want yeah. to drive slow, yeah. that's yeah. fine. Stay yeah. in the yeah. slow yeah. lane. Slow that's what yeah. Definitely. No, yeah. you're right. I, I agree, Mikey. And yeah. I, one of the, my, my pet hate on the road is when you let, you know, when you let someone out of a junction. Yeah. yeah. And they don't say thanks. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's Fucking like amazing. you're welcome. You know yeah, what? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what my my head, does my head in. Because mm. I, I only uh rode in um rode in a cab throughout throughout the city when I was there. Uh, mm. but like here, because where we live, shit ton of freeways, right? Yeah. So I hate when some stupid son of a bitch, because like our speed limit is 65, will get on the freeway at 35. Oh yeah. Right. I'm yeah. converting that to kilometers, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, okay, so you want us all to die. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> or when it's raining and you drive 10 miles an hour because you're trying to be safe. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. more dangerous going this slow. Well, going that slow. Yeah. I'm not saying floor it when it's raining. No, I'm just saying no, no. maintain the flow of traffic. <laughs> Hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, enough about driving. Speaking, yeah. of, speaking of shit that annoys us, uh, any pet peeves? What are your some of your your peeves that uh, just irk the shit out of you, other than driving? Other than driving is uh, another one which which only happened the other day, and, and I know sooner or later I'm going to get into trouble. But when I go into a shop and then I um you know open the door for someone when they go out and they don't say thank you. It's this thank you thing. It does my head in. Whether it's in the car, whether I'm opening the door for someone at a shop and they just they don't say a word. It's like yeah, you're obliged to open the door from fucking hell. It's just, it's just, they're, they're little things that, that I hate. So it's bad manners, really. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Bad, that, that's what I hate. Bad manners. That's what I hate. Do you I'm ever say you're, you're welcome, anyways, even if they don't say thank you? I've done that. Yeah. I've, 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just say, I'll say, oh, yeah. I, I won't say you. I'll say, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll shout it to make sure they hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. do that. Like, I'll open the door for them and, you know, whoever it is. And they just walk right in. I'm like, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I just keep walking. It's like, dude, who are you? I didn't have to do that. Yeah. I'll get some people. Dick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have an extra, excellent day. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> what would be something that people would be surprised to know about you like any interesting hobby any interesting or... random fact yeah okay random i'm trying fact. to figure out how i was going to phrase that question but... yeah yeah a random fact about me um maybe uh we could say my name my name so my name is Obviously, you know, everyone calls me Tony. So my name, my full name is Nereri, which is N-Y-R-E-R-E, -E -E, Nereri, oh, wow. and, and Anthony Kelly. And Nereri is was taken by my dad back in the back in the 60s when they when they uh, were living in Comcha. They had a mum and dad had a lodger, uh, African lodger. And uh, this is back in the 50s, 60s, mum and dad, you know, 80s now. They had, they had this lodger and um, he left he left a book lying around. This is what my dad told me, not left a book lying around. And uh, there was African names in this book. And he picked out Nereri and this Nereri is the ex-president of Tanzania. Huh. God knows why he did, but I am christened Nereri, Anthony Kelly. That's uh, interesting. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Kelly? Uh, we always like to leave the guests with the last words of encouragement, uh, you know, be it if someone listening is or loving, yeah. struggling with gambling addiction, or if it's just, you know, just something mm. positive in general. I want to leave on two notes. So one is like, like whether it's, whether it's in the U S uh, whether it's football or being a basketball player or whatever, you know, sports person that you're aspiring to be, I would say that. And in the UK, as a, as a young footballer, to get rejected from clubs and all that, I would say that just never give up. Um, always strive for your dream because, you know, lots of people get second chances. And you've got to take that second chance. So that's one thing for young people to, to, uh, that I would like to sort of stress is that it's never too late to give up, even, even when you've been rejected at a younger age, because um, there's, there's hundreds of ex, um, there's hundreds of sportsmen out there in different possession, pro professions that have had rejection at a young age and still gone on to be superstars. Mm. So that's one. And in terms of the gambling side of things, um, I said to you earlier that I never thought in a million years that I would be a CEO of a, of a company, of my own company, and that I would be doing public speaking and that I would be writing books. Um, but in terms of what I want, particularly the second book, which has just been published, um, Red Card, I Bet You Can Win. I like that title because that, that's the way I see it. Um, that was published two weeks ago. As you know, it's available on Amazon US. Uh, and I would say that book, I want to inspire people to know that you can come out of adversity, you can recover from trauma, and you can, you know, move on to a healthy and sustainable life. Uh, so it's not, it's not, all hope is not lost. Just remember that. Absolutely. Yeah. Love, man. Love that. Well, Mr. Kelly, this has been fucking awesome. Too bad we're way across the pond because... I, I, I hope we get a conversation in person one of these days. Let's go to it's another day. Day. So do I. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so what part of America are you both in? California. 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 Oh, right. That's California's nice, isn't it? 
Oh yeah. It is where we're at is so we do this. Just it's like it's, we're like in an ag area, so we're about two a uh, two hour drive from like the coastal area. Yeah. I like okay. to just say California and just let people's imaginations go. Yeah. We're friends with the Kardashians. We surf to work, <laughs> all that yeah. good stuff. I like to just let their imaginations go. Yeah. Yeah. It brings yeah. us to reality. I have a blonde <laughs> brunette and redheaded friends, you know, they're all yeah. Yeah, but no, but through through social media and through Catherine, I'm definitely gonna over the next uh, three or four months keep in touch because I think there will be a time where because I, I I do want to have a little mini break and but maybe a time where I can come to America when oh, everything yeah, dies down. Once that. everything dies, yeah, once everything dies down, I might I might come if I go because me and my brother are talking about you know you talk about um, life goals and things you want to do before you get old or whatever. Yeah, just certain yeah. things that you were doing. We were talking the other day about. Where's our next trip going to be? My parents are in St. Vincent, which is obviously the Caribbean. Yeah, my mum's yeah. out, mom's out there. Um, but we were talking about America. And so uh, thing you, you asked a question earlier, something else they might know about me. This will get you. Uh -huh. There is two of me. You have a twin? Identical? Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. fun. Yeah, it's fun. it is fun. It's absolutely brilliant. I mean, some of the st stories we had twin with the twin stories when we were younger. You know, yeah, we have some great, oh, yeah. <laughs> have some great times. But yeah, my twin, we're very, very close, twenty minutes apart. Um, the only difference is he didn't become a professional footballer, but I did, obviously did. But we're very close. And so, yeah, if if we decide in the next three, four, five months when things go down that we want to have a trip, then we'll come together. Yeah, that's That'd awesome. Who's awesome. twenty minutes older? Who's the older one? He's 20 minutes older than me. Oh, he's okay. Yeah, so right, you're the okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we yeah. should absolutely stay in touch. We'd love to have you out here. Yeah. yeah that'd be brilliant. That'd be Especially brilliant. Especially because I know as things uh, uh, continue to open up, one of our agendas was to try to create uh, speaking engagements, you know, and guests and stuff like that. So, especially if it's something where, hey, we can also do a little bit of business for you, you know, and, and, and help some people in life. And hey, cool. Yeah. Extra brilliant. Bonus. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mate, brilliant. Well, thank well, you, you too. Sir. I know it's <laughs> you later two are, you, the day there. You, you, yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. You two are a good double act, though. I'll give you that. You're a good double act. Mm -hmm. uh, appreciate <laughs> it. We yeah. appreciate your time, too, my friend. Yeah.